Welcome back. I'm Connie Sokol, your host. It's called to create, and we are so delighted to have our wonderful guest today, Ryan Shoup. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. Hi, thanks for having me. So, so excited. We've been chatting beforehand, and that's why I'm smiling so big. This is going to be a fun interview. So relaxed, so fun. We're going to find out all the ups and downs and in between of being a musician and running your own band. So musicians, this is for you, but for everyone, we're going to be talking about the journey and how to stay in the game. Let me give you the official bio. Ryan Shoup and the Rubber Band is a five-man band from Salt Lake City, Utah. Winning over live audiences has been Shoup's natural-born talent since childhood. A fifth-generation fiddler, he started performing with his siblings at age 10. He formed the rubber band with the idea of drawing from a pool of musicians who could wander in and out. However, certain members have seemed to stick and the band soon became a cohesive unit. They took the Bluegrass Festival in Colorado by storm, winning the live band contest, and then launched into the national music scene. They also signed with Capitol Records and later with Montage Music Group. The rubber band's music is beloved, goes from ballads to rock. It's complex, but melodic enough for those who want to hear the tune and tap their feet to the rhythm. He and his wife are the parents of four children, and he is with us today to give us all the ins and outs. Let's just jump right in to this sound, okay? You even have kind of a funky name, a really long name for this unique <laughs> sound. Well, I used to call the band post ha Funkadelic Hip Hop Newgrass, but then people just kept you know, like scratching their heads, like what in the world is that? And so I don't use that as much, but I just kind of say like, oh, I don't know, rock and roll bluegrass, because then they kind of can grasp it like, oh, okay, I get it. Bluegrass, but it's kind of rock, you know, so. Yes. But uh, exactly. I just thought it was funny to have that name. I love that picture of you that has the, you know, electric guitar and then it has the fiddle and it's got both. And so you can feel that amalgamation of both. That's a really unique sound and it's so fun. How did you come up with that? Was that really from those family roots or was it something that was more Ryan shoot? Well, I am a fifth generation fiddle player, right? So my dad got me up, you know, to practice before school every day. And then when I was about 10, he was like, well, maybe we should start a band. It was called the Pee Wee Pickers. It was a bunch of little kids and we traveled around. We went to Europe and we played at like the World's Fair and all these crazy places, right? And so that was lots of fun. I was playing bluegrass, but I always liked rock music. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like rock, rock pop. But when I got in college, I thought I want to have a band because everybody wants a band in college, right? Right, right. And so I thought, well, let me kind of take the bluegrass that I have and combine it with kind of the rock sound and we'll kind of go that route. And how do people respond, especially in college? Do they start saying, yeah, I like this? It's kind of funny because the music kind of stays in the same area, but then the music industry will shift, yes. you know, so like we're kind of over here and people are like, oh, that's kind of country or whatever. And then over time, all of a sudden, like Mumford and Sons comes out or something and they're like the biggest rock band. But who would have thought that a band with, you know, banjo and upright bass would be like a, considered a rock band. So, you know, we kind of shifts you know through the different music styles but when we first started i think the dave matthews band came out and so there was kind of a jam band resurgence so it it did kind of mesh in with a few things that were go going on you know because we're kind of jammy and they had mixed in like they had the, the violin and the, it was kind of instrumental and you know kind of jammy so anyway i kind of heard them in another room i was working at weaver state university where i went and I, uh, someone was listening to it and I heard the violin. I went in there and I was like, what, what's this? This sounds kind of like, you know, similar to like what I was thinking as far as not taking the standard route. You usually think of like a band would be like, okay, electric guitar, bass, you know, drums. drum. But I was kind of like, how do I infuse fiddle and mandolin and banjo into this music? So I was like, oh, they're infusing these other instruments into kind of a and more it's rocky working. sound. Yeah. And it's working and people like it. I kind of think of Sting that way where he brought in some different instruments that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily link him to in his early days. But I think this sort of a unique sound, I think it's incredible that you've been able to essentially keep that red thread running through everything that you're doing and that you have found the audience, regardless of what the changes are in the music industry. And have you 
found like a sweet spot tip or tool that helps you do that? Because it seems like your genre is family entertainment. Would you say that's fair? It's it's really anyone can sit down and listen to and you can listen to it in groups and you know it's going to be clean, but you also know it's going to be fun, toe tapping. You're going to walk away feeling upbeat and, and happy about it. Is that something that you ever felt? Did you ever get pressure in the music industry to not be like that? Or did you ever have a question in your mind? I'm thinking about our listeners and how you, you start out with something and you say, this is the thing I'm offering. And then you start getting pressure from people of, well, you should be more like this and you should add that and you should have more bling and sequin jacket. And you know what I mean? And start changing it. <laughs> Did you feel any pressure to change that or need to change that? Well, I mean, the sequin jacket, I mean, that's. <laughs> it's that still a good be, idea. It's not. That would be me. spectacular, right? <laughs> no, my opinion is. You know, everybody comes out with an album and the new thing they say is like, what, what is this album? Oh, it's more edgy, you know, or this, it's more. And I'm just kind of like, I don't know. I mean, so I just want to create a counterculture where I'm like, well, it's just, you know, it's fun and there's humor in it. Music has kind of lost some of its humor, you know, yeah. overall, like it, it should be fun. And so I've always just kind of shot for like, yeah, you can bring your whole family to and that the music is kind of crosses all these different genres, right? Yes. And so a lot of people can come and enjoy it together. And it also, good skill, but it's also, you know, good music and is bringing goodness to the world, you know? Yes. So I've always kind of strove, is that a word? Strove? <laughs> we'll call it good. It's good. <laughs> Sounds like a word. Yeah, it's good. Strived, whatever. I've always kind of worked toward, you know, bringing that kind of counterculture where it would, you know, bring goodness to the world and not always be looking for like, oh, we're going to be more edgy and whatever. Yeah. So yeah. And then in answer to your question, I think it's important to kind of know what you want to do as an artist, you know, like, okay, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what, you know, my boundaries are, and this is what's worth it to me. And this is what's not worth it to me. But yeah, everybody's going to tell you different things like, oh, you need to do this. Or, you know, one time we were making this music video and the producer of the video had lined up all of these things and they had these dancers and they were kind of like in the stereotypical you know, oh. short shorts, crop top, you know. And so we were like, I don't know if that's going to work for us. I don't think that's our vibe, you know. I don't know if I, that's what I want to go down in, in history as in my videos, having all these girls dancing around. So they had two outfits picked out because I think they maybe knew. So they had like the one outfit and then they had like, and if you don't like that one, we've got this one that's not quite as, you know, risque. And so we went for that. You just have to kind of set what you, works for you and know that I got to live with that, you know, yes. and this yeah. is what's, this is what I'm fine with. And if, and if it doesn't work out because of that, then that's okay. I'm fine with it because otherwise I would have been doing something that I didn't want to do anyway. Exactly. And that's such a core concept. And to follow that, that driver that, you know, that's what you can stay true to. So let's go to when you were getting that record deal with Capitol Records, how did that come about and how, how did that work for you? Yeah, that was awesome. Those guys are great. I mean, I love those guys. They did a great job. It was super fun. There's all these paths you try and then there's just one that works out and then you follow that and it goes up to more and then another one works out. It's kind of like that. We started touring. We were playing on our own. We were kind of independent. So we were playing over 150 shows a year, just touring around. And we won this, this thing in Salt Lake for the Salt Lake Weekly or, you know, it was called South by Southwest competition where a band, if they won, they would get, they would fly them down to South by Southwest, which is like a big music industry showcase a big town where everybody gets together and parties and there's all these bands playing so we entered that and and then i remember we were walking around and i was like i i gotta like just do something here like i just had this idea like we gotta at least find some kind of contact so i went into this manager meeting and i just looked around and there's all these people on this this panel and i went up to this girl and i said hey you know, I'm going to give you the CD. I'm sure you get tons of CDs, but all I want to know, because I, I was kind of like our music was, which it still is to this day, it doesn't really fit. So I gave her a CD and I said, hey, you know, a, a CD back in the day. I right. said, hey, I don't know. Just listen to this if you can and just tell me where you think are the most efficient way of pushing it into the music industry, because music industry has you know, they have certain boxes, you know, oh, so I was just, just listen to this and tell me where you think we fit. And she said, okay. And then she ended up giving them to another 
manager friend of hers. And then he called me and said, Hey, you know, I have all these CDs and I just listened to yours and yours is like, fantastic. This is amazing. You know, what are you planning on doing? And, and he said, well, what you should do is go to Nashville and go play on this showcase thing. And so we applied for it and, you know, used his name. And so we got on and then we went and played there once. And then we played there again. And, and by the second time we had rolled through town and I remember we were in our van and we were saying, we're playing the showcase. We need to like call people in Nashville and just tell them to come, yes. you know? And so I think one of our buddies said, oh, I, I know someone that lives there and I know someone else. And and so we were calling them. And then this guy came, Jason Deere, came to the showcase and he was like, hey, you guys, what do you guys want to do? You're, you guys are great. And he started kind of saying, well, why don't we get you signed to a record deal? You know, and we hadn't really thought of a record deal. We're just thinking, all we want to do is find someone to book a show. Is that's what we really want. That's right. We just want to play. We just want to play, you know. And so he was like, no, 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 let's do this. Let's craft this, you know, the CD. And we'll pitch it to the label. And so we're like, okay, cool. Sounds good. And so he was kind of the mastermind behind that. And that's how that came about. I kind of view the music industry as like surfing. You have a wave. And if a wave comes in, then you just kind of ride the wave. But you're like always out there paddling around and trying to make things happen. Sometimes you just, you catch a little wave or sometimes it's like a bad surf day and it's not as good. But that was like a big wave that we caught. You just ride it in and just enjoy it for as long as you can. And out of all the people in the world who do music, I mean, there's only a handful of people that reach that level, which is great. I mean, you should definitely like, you know, shoot for that. And so you got to get in and ride your wave. But, you know, here's the thing. 99% of every act you have ever heard of in your entire life, from when you were a kid or whatever, they're still out there playing. And they probably released an album last year. You just haven't heard of them because for some reason, they either aren't with their label or fads kind of change or whatever. Name any band you totally loved back when you were in high school or college or whatever. And I guarantee you, they're still touring. They have an album they just released. So my my point is people will ride the wave and then they they find their fans and they, you know, communicate with those people and yes. and then you work with them and you know, people get to know you and and then maybe like something else comes in. Maybe you get a placement in a TV show or something, and oh, you have another little wave that comes in, or or maybe you get signed to another major label. Really ultimately for me, I feel like the biggest payback is when I could influence someone like an email saying, Hey, you helped me. I was like feeling really down and your songs helped lift my spirit or if even crazier things were like, well, I was going to commit suicide, but then I heard your song come on the radio. It doesn't matter if you are huge or what, it's just, if you can help a, one person or multiple yeah. people, you know, then, then that's amazing. I think the music industry in, you know, creating maybe in general, you know, we tend to compare and you look at, oh, wow, they're so big. And how do I get to be like that? And and that's just totally natural. But there's always going to be someone bigger who makes more money. And there's always going to be someone smaller who wants to be like you. Then eventually, as you kind of work your way up, you know, or move forward, you'll find some level in there. So great. And I, what I'm hearing from you, especially for the listeners, is that it sounds like love to play, right? Just love what you're doing and then do good with it and you'll ride those waves and they will come and go in the size or the frequency or whatever. But if you love what you're doing and it's a almost like a calling, like we talk about here, a call to create, if you feel like this is where I am to play word play there, but where the Lord wants me to play, then it's okay. The waves will come and go. Did you ever feel a time that you felt like this is what the Lord wants me to do? Or was it more of, I just want to do this and the Lord's helping me do it. Well, that is a good question. I mean, initially I feel like I've been led to play music. I, I remember when I started the band, I felt really driven to make a CD. I didn't really know how I would pay for it or what would happen. I didn't think that I'd play music for a job, but I just know I need to make this CD. And, and then we'll just see where it goes if it like keeps building, you know? So I did that. I remember one time I was kind of on a walk and I was kind of praying about it. Like, should I do something else or... You know, I mean, this is after I had been doing it for a long time. So I've been following it and I felt guided. And, but then I felt like I heard this voice or something telling me, Hey, you know, you know, don't worry about it. I've taken care of you in the past. Right. So I'll take care of you in the future. And so I was like, Oh, well, yeah, I guess that's true. So then since then, you know, I haven't really worried as much and that doesn't mean, Oh, 
you are going to be the biggest rock star in the world. It wasn't that. There are levels of like taking care of. And obviously you still have to work, but I still feel like, okay, yeah, I feel like Heavenly Father has got my back. So since then, I've just thought, well, maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. I have been blessed with a skill set of playing music and writing songs and and your um, band and everybody coming together and staying and yeah. Yeah. I have like a uncanny skill to make all my band members like mentally degrade to like a 15 year old. <laughs> but I, I feel like I can be comfortable on stage and make people in the audience feel comfortable. There's a certain skill set with those yes. and that I've kind of been blessed with. And you've been able to have that moment of, okay. I'm going to keep going and it doesn't need to be big spelled out in the sky and big balloons and sold out arenas of, you know, a hundred thousand people at a time, but it can be what heavenly father wants me to be. And I'll just keep moving forward. And of course that would be amazing to have giant shows. And we're always working toward that. Right. But it it is a kind of a balancing act. You want to be content, but you also want to push forward. Yeah. As an example, like the, our Christmas tour, we started with one show and, then went, did a couple shows. It's been kind of growing for over 10 years or so, but you have to see the vision of what you want to do and then just keep paddling toward that. Now we're in Idaho and Colorado and Nevada, Arizona and Utah. You know what I mean? So it's like slowly growing, but it's taking effort. I think that's a really important thing for the listeners is for them to feel the validity of doing the daily, of getting up, working hard, doing, having your goals and your dreams, And then, like you said, be content with that day's work and that step on the path and then get up and do it again the next day, keeping those big pictures and those big dreams that fuel the everyday. So I think that's awesome. And I wanted to ask you, because this is, this is a a waves going up and down like this, right? So let's talk about your family for a minute. How has your wife and your kids navigated this and and been influenced by it? Because I know you have a daughter who's a songwriter and a son who does drums. And so they've been influenced along the way with this journey. I'm sure your wife has had to navigate this too and how it's impacted and influenced in good ways, both of you and your family. I have a bunch of instruments laying around the house. I leave them out for them to play. I've encouraged them to play, but I also, I wasn't as crazy as my dad. I didn't get them up every morning to practice. Starting with my oldest, you know, Riley, she's a songwriter. She's always been a really great writer and combining that with music. And now she's really, you know, she's been able to kind of really channel this songwriting thing. We have a song almost recorded and we're mixing it and we're going to kind of pitch it out to different people and see what kind of response. And then, you know, if we get anything there, then we'll follow that. If not, we're going to put it up on Spotify and start moving forward. So she's plays the guitar, a little violin, but you know, songwriter and, you know, a good voice. And she's, you know, really fun. And then my second Trevor, he, I don't know, for some reason, he just gravitated toward the drums a little bit, but he also plays a little mandolin and guitar on the side. And the other little ones are still kind of finding their way, but one of them really loves piano and loves to sing. I think they also can see, you know, the music industry is all over the place. So, you know, so maybe, (laughs) maybe, Maybe it goes in like every other generation, maybe. (laughs) My dad's like, yeah, you should play music. And then I play music. And then my kids look at that and go like, well, that's just a crazy job. Like, (laughs) And so maybe they're going to be more, you know, pragmatic. I don't know. The last one is my wife. She's been amazing and supportive and she's supportive of all the kids and, and she's great. And she claims to not be a musician, but she does sing good and stuff, but it's just kind of funny. I love how you've made that such an optional thing. And you, you felt to just let it be organic for them to find their musical way in the way that they want to. I think that's wonderful. In fact, that was one of the questions that I have for you is what have you learned on the business side? Because so many musicians, especially that I talk to, or that you hear from, they talk about how it's such a a shock that they have to think business minded as well as be creatives. I have like a couple of rental properties, not like I'm some real estate mogul, but it's interesting as I look back, I can totally see that Heavenly Father was guiding me. Now looking back, I realize like, oh, I get it. That's like a more of a a master plan. I know this isn't music, but I'm going to guide you in these other areas. And then you're going to realize that was so instrumental in being able to give you the option to create. So anyway, I look at the music business as a, as a whole, 
but uh, the diversification of those assets feed into, you know, the parent company of music, right? Exactly. And so that's just provides, you know, money to come in to be able to like, and give more know, options, make it yeah. more options. So then you can create more. So yeah, I mean, thinking of it like a business is kind of, kind of hard. And that's like, my least favorite of the things, you know, but yeah, I just think a lot of things about the old music industry that I think are, are like amazing. And I kind of got in, you know, midway. So there was still some kind of old school things. The old school before me was like, all the radio stations were separate and you could go in and you could just walk into Tulsa, Oklahoma and say, Hey, I have a band and give them your CD. And they might be like, Oh, well, let's just play it. That sounds awesome. Now it's like more corporatized and radio stations are all owned by mostly national conglomerates. And so a while ago, you could probably be more of an artist and, you know, play music. And then you have all these peripheral things working towards you. But I feel like nowadays you can't just say, well, I'm just a great singer. You have to know how to do social media and you have to know how to marketing and, mm -hmm. you know, speak Photoshop or speak video or know how to edit videos or you just have to be able to do all those things. Otherwise, you know, so I mean, that's a great point. And I love that you brought that up because that is part and parcel. You don't hand out a CD, right? Like it is like those things. I mean, yes and no, but I just had someone hand me one the other day and it was so like, it just kind of took me by surprise that I went, oh, because it's so different nowadays. It seems like, like you said, things have been more yeah. It's more like you said, that corporate feel and more of a, they're systemized is the word that I was looking for. It just feels like it's more systemized and, and you got to get into that flow and the conveyor belt and the system to be able to be a part of it. If we could ask how the gospel has helped you along this path, has it been an anchor or has it give you, you've talked about those, those moments where Heavenly Father has guided you. Have there been any other principles, gospel principles that have helped you along the way to help you really keep moving forward in this path? You just have to know what you're willing to do. For me, the gospel is the most important thing. So how do I not kill that side of my life, right? And so what things do I need to do to preserve that? So I've set certain boundaries. For me, it's kind of like, I'd rather not do it if it's going to make me lose these certain things in my life, right? But there's this Mormon message. I don't, we, need, we need to come up with a new name for it, I guess, like that. It's got such a long title. It's hard to be alliterative. It's hard to like- Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints messages, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's not quite as the same impact, but it was this gold prospector and he, he's out panning for gold and the young guy comes along and he's like, hey, teach me how to be a gold prospector. I want to be rich like you. And so the old guy is like, oh yeah, let me take you in. And so they're out there panning around him they find these little gold flakes right and he starts putting them in his bag and finally the young guy just gets frustrated he's like oh my gosh like all i'm finding are these stupid gold flakes i want to see what's in your gold bag what big the nuggets big yeah. chunks of nuggets and so then opens up his bag and it's just like tons of gold flakes and so the message is a lot of times it's just the little gold flakes you keep accumulating obviously you you should always just shoot for the stars. And there are those moments like that are like big defining moments. Not very often is it some girls just singing karaoke somewhere and then a record producer's right there and he's like, oh my gosh, we're going to make you a star. And then she becomes a star. I really feel like there's this saying where it says almost everything you try, 70% of it is going to be a failure, right? You have to know like, oh yeah, you're going to fail most of the time, but try something else or do something else. Keep moving. Yeah. Collect the little gold flakes and then eventually you'll have a lot of gold flakes. And that's how I view it. I love this. A lot of gold flakes, collect the gold flakes, <laughs> ride the waves. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Those who are listening are going to want to be able to connect with you. What's the best way for them to do that? Probably, you know, ryanshoop.com is the website. Uh, I have Facebook, Ryan Shoop. I know Instagram the Ryan Shoop. Just, yeah, follow that. A bald guy with a mandolin. There's not that many. <laughs> that, that's my unique branding. Come on. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate the things you've shared today. And I hope that those people listening, especially musicians, have been able to take this to heart and find that contentment and that joy in moving forward the bigger goals, but being content with the day-to-day -day adding in those golden flakes. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.
And if you have loved this interview, please check out our other ones. We have the best guests who are sharing their ups, downs, and in-betweens of their creative journey. Steve Young, Jane Clayson Johnson, John Heater, who's, you know, Napoleon Dynamite, all these wonderful people who are here sharing their experiences to help you on your journey of being called to create.